Hello everyone, my name is Steven and welcome to Storytime. Today we're going to be reading some malicious compliance stories. Tales where following the rules can lead to some just desserts. And let me just say, if you're not already subscribed to Storytime, please consider doing so. But with that being said, let's sit back, relax, and listen to some captivating Reddit stories. Give me more ganache! I work at a bakery. While we bake cakes, cookies, brownies, and bread among other things, our main focus is cupcakes. A customer can walk in and choose from an array of cupcakes at any given time of our store hours. Some of our cupcakes are dipped in ganache as part of their decoration. However, if you try to dip a cupcake upside down into chocolate, the frosting is just going to slide off. So we freeze the cupcakes. We have power freezers so it's usually only about 30 minutes before the frosting is hard enough to dip. We have this one customer who we all call Ganache Lady. She comes in and chooses a cupcake at random, then asks us to put ganache on top. We've told her time and time again to call 30 to 40 minutes ahead of time so we can freeze the cupcake which makes our lives easier and she would get the perfect amount of ganache. Nope. She refuses to do it. The most recent time she was in, she wanted ganache on a raspberry cupcake. And of course, I was the one to serve her. I had dealt with her before and the previous time I had her, she sent me to the back three times to put more ganache on her cupcake. This time, I think she recognized me and made sure to say, put a lot of ganache, like a lot, and didn't even say please. Now, our ganache bottles that we typically use for filling cupcakes with chocolate are roughly the shape of a stereotypical cookout condiment bottle, only curvier. The top screws off. So I go to the back, microwave the bottle so the ganache flows easier, and put the cupcake in one of our serving bowls. I unscrew the top and turn the bottle completely upside down and just let it run. When the cupcake is completely covered on the top and ganache is dripping down the sides, I take it back to Ganache Lady. I would have poured the whole bottle on the cupcake if I could have gotten even half the reaction that she gave me. She stared at it for a solid 20 seconds in complete silence before glaring at me. I didn't mean that much. I'm sorry, you said a lot. It's fine. I didn't mean that much, but it's fine. You could call ahead so we can freeze the cupcake, then it would be the perfect amount. She glares at me more and proceeds to lick some chocolate off her fingers and puts her chocolatey spit-covered fingers on my pen to sign the receipt. I threw the pen out, but since then, she's been much less picky. So, I understand why the lady would enjoy having a lot more ganache and whatnot. That's completely fine to want even more on your cupcakes and stuff. The thing I don't understand is the unwillingness to call 30 to 40 minutes ahead to make sure that they got the cupcakes perfect. Like, if you could call them up, tell them exactly what you want, and know that when you get there, they're going to be A, ready, and B, exactly how you want them, wouldn't you just go ahead and start doing that? Maybe she's allergic to phones. 35 years ago, when I was a waitress in a diner, a family came in and each ordered a meal. There was a kid about maybe 12 years old, and with his meal, he ordered a small drink. Times have mostly changed now. But then, free refills weren't a thing. You got your drink, but you had to pay for a refill. Don't remember how much it cost. It was 35 years ago. So I brought out the drinks, and the kid was kind of snotty, going on about how he'd ordered a large drink, not a small drink. He hadn't done that, and normally I wouldn't mind switching it, but his unnecessary rudeness irritated me. So I went back to the drink station, poured the contents of his small drink into a large cup, and then packed it to the top with ice. Didn't add a drop more soda. He seemed pretty convinced he'd won the battle when I came back with his large drink, but I think I walked away with having won the war. Treat your waiters and waitresses right, folks. If you have the means, please try to tip them. Please try and be nice to them as they have to serve so many people. And as long as they're not rude to you, then you shouldn't be rude to them. And you wouldn't get any revenge or anything like that like OP gave to this naughty person. He wanted the door closed, so I closed it. I work in a warehouse with four other guys. One of the guys thinks that just because he is the dad of the owner slash boss, that he is also the owner slash boss. He is generally a nice guy, so we let him believe that. In reality, he is just a delivery guy slash warehouse help like the rest of us. We all share one washroom, which can get a bit smelly from time to time. We have an air freshener, but that usually just makes it smell like flowery poop instead of just regular poop. 
I found keeping the door open when not in use helped regulate the smells. Owner's dad decided that he preferred the door closed so he doesn't have to look at the toilet while he is working, and was constantly closing it after I left it open. My desk is close enough to the washroom that I could hear his comments as he had to close the door every time I left it open. He got so angry that he made handwritten signs saying please close door and taped them around the washroom. When I didn't close the door after he put his signs up, he bought and installed an automatic closer for the door. I found out that even with the closer on, you could still prop the door open with a wedge, so that's what I did. He saw me do it and yelled at me, again because he thinks he is the boss. I figured the easiest thing to do was just close the dang door and make him happy, so I did. Fast forward to a year later, we hired another guy to help with the deliveries. He is the nicest guy in the world, but something about his diet gave him the worst smelling bathroom movements. Like, it smelled like he had eaten raw sewage for lunch, pooped that out, and eaten it again. It was so bad. I hear owner's dad go into the washroom after him one day, and he comments about how much it stinks. As he leaves the washroom, despite his handwritten sign still being up, he propped the door open. Cue malicious compliance. I walked over and removed the wedge and closed the door. Every time I used the washroom, I closed the door behind me. In the reverse of the year before, every time I closed the door, he would go and open it, grumbling the whole time. He got so bad that he would wait till after I was done and close the door to walk over and reopen it. I was following his rules and still peeing him off at the same time. It was great. He eventually took his signs down and told us all to keep the bathroom door open when not in use to help vent the smells. Hmm, I wonder who thought of that? I feel like instead of fighting about the door being closed or open, the boss guy probably could have done something that helps the smell rather than the door situation if he wanted it closed so bad. Maybe some kind of vent, maybe some kind of fan. Something that actually alleviates the problem and makes it acceptable to keep the door closed, rather than just keeping all those smells tucked away in the bathroom. Corona, home office, work laws, and sleazy CEOs are great for malicious compliance. It's time to vent a bit, but at the same time enjoy some poetic justice. Or karma. Call it how you want. I work IT in a company that belongs to a larger conglomerate. We are based in Germany, where work laws have suffered but are still stronger than in other countries. As a matter of fact, our resident union has always tried to convince our company to sign a contract allowing home office. You know, not just an oral commitment to the general idea, but something that's clearly regulated and written out in legalese so that both sides know exactly what goes and goes not. And of course, so that both sides, yes, also the employee, can suit, uh, take action if their rights are being ignored. So that contract was finally set up, signed by our union reps, and went to the bigwigs. And then they lost it, and apparently ghosted our union reps each time the topic was brought up. Fast forward a year or so, Corona rears its ugly head. So our big wig sent out a message ordering every employee to take their laptops home each evening so that they can work from home in case of an emergency or our company being shut down because of an infection, etc. This in itself was a doomed idea for several reasons. One, we don't have enough licenses for the softwares required for remote access for each and every user. Two, not every user even has a laptop. And three, not all required software and services are available via remote. Since it was never necessary, people didn't do home office because remember, you lost the contract and also struck down 95% of personal inquiries about exceptions. So far, so dumb, but here comes the icing on the cake. The Poetic Justice A few minutes after their mail, our union rep sent out another mail and told us that we are not required to do this, as there is no official contract that allows the employees to work from home. And thus, our place of work is in the company, and if the company gets shut down, tough luck, huh? I sincerely hope our union will now tighten the finger screws and Corona will bring us a signed contract allowing home office. We'll see. Update, so today I had to reactivate as many old laptops as possible. They are sending my older colleagues to work from home effective today, 
and have advised everyone to minimize personal contact and stay within their own office if possible. My question is why I couldn't work from home. Also, if I have to minimize contact and preferably stay in the office anyway, didn't get a satisfactory answer. The union is really trying its best to help you out here. Maybe if you get too frustrated with it, the next course of action might be a little bit of unionizing amongst the actual in-office workers. A little bit of, we all need to take a trip to the boss's office today, and uh, we're feeling particularly touchy on surfaces that we see. Something that just really drives home the point of how important home office is. Lady wants us to take care of her while we're closed. I'm a pharmacist in the United States and I work in a really busy supermarket. All last week, people were going really crazy trying to stock up, panic buy, everything in the store. We naturally got a decent amount of carryover craziness from the store being so busy. One of the days, I come in at 8am and open the gate. We leave it open about halfway because technically we don't open for business until 8.30, but it lets my technician sneak in underneath. I've barely opened the gate and shut off the security system when a lady ducks down under the gate and starts shouting at me. Keep in mind that I haven't even taken my coat off. There are no computers or cash registers on, and there is no money in the cash registers. Why aren't you open? We don't open at 8.30, gestures to huge visible hours sign. Someone last night told me you were open at 8. Well, I apologize about that, but there must have been a miscommunication. So what does that mean? I can't pick up my prescription? I'd be happy to help you out with that, but... Gestures to close registers and computers. We have no cash or registers. Lady, now shouting. Well, how freaking long is it going to take you then? At this point, I should say that if someone is paying with a credit or debit card, I can log into the register and process a card without having to go to the office and get cash. In this case though, this lady was so nice to us that we personally walked her up to the front of the store to cash out for her prescription. This was at 8am while everyone in town was panicking about coronavirus. There were very few cashiers, and so, so many people trying to cash out. She waited a long time in line. Honestly, if I was OP and this lady was screaming at me under the gate when we're obviously not open yet, I would just make her wait the half hour. I'd be like, lady, I don't mind if you're standing there, I don't mind if you're talking to me, but we're not going to be open for 30 minutes and I can't help you until then. So if you could please allow me and my technicians to set up the store, we can help you out in that time, or something like that. Hopefully a little bit nicer, probably. And uh, if she gets livid, so be it. That's not my fault. The dial-ups must only be used for schoolwork. Back in the early 90s, I was attending a very large university in a southwest desert state that's known for this gigantic natural wonder in the northern part of the state. I worked on campus in the Campus Network Telecommunications Department. At the time, the internet was still mostly major universities connected together with some military and government connections, like the Lunar and Planetary Labs. The World Wide Web was not a thing yet, and if you wanted to communicate with the other two universities in this state, your network traffic ran through my university because that's how it was set up. Thus, in the network telecom department where I worked, we were tasked as the overseers of the network, and they didn't mince words. All computer networks, phone networks, etc. were in our domain. Back then, the university had several unsupervised terminal labs. Three were 24-hour where students could connect to their choice of university computers based on which department they were doing work for. Popular choices were the engineering computers, computer science Unix systems, and physics vaccine. But other departments had systems as well, and from there hopped to their platform of choice. The university also had supervised PC labs for work that required Windows or Mac applications, and those were heavily regulated. I only visited them once in a blue moon because those labs were under the control of a different department. In this time period, online bulletin board systems, BBSs, multi-user chats, mugs, rooms and multi-user dungeons, MUDs, were the biggest things going. Notes were posted in every terminal lab and every PC lab that gaming was unacceptable, use of resources and that users risked losing access if caught. If caught. Yeah, it's pretty hard to police this stuff when the terminal labs are unsupervised to begin with. Now, we in the control center had direct access to all the terminals and could remotely kick people off whatever they were doing if needed. 
We were empowered by the bosses that if there were complaints about people gaming in the labs, all we needed was the terminal lab location and the terminal number and we could boot the user off. Of course, the user could always just move to another terminal, but the bosses didn't seem to care that much about the details. However, not a lot of people complained, quite honestly, because why would they? The late night gamers were in the lab when nobody was really around and they didn't leave messes or anything, so who cared? Unbeknownst to most of the university population, we also had a bank of dial-up modems at 4800 baud. For those students that liked to do their schoolwork from home, this information was not widely disseminated at the time. We were, are still, a very large university with easily 35,000 enrolled at the time, but we only had a bank of maybe 50, if that, modems. So when word got out about the modem bank, naturally those late night gamers began playing their muds from home instead of from the 24 hour labs. This quickly started escalating as we would get phone calls at 8, 9, 10 PM. I am getting a busy signal when dialing into the modems. Since we had to document every incoming phone call, the bosses started getting a little upset at the non-school related use, abuse, of the modem bank. Cue malicious compliance. The bosses said, anytime you find someone playing games via the modem bank, drop their connection. The very first night after that edict, a user called to complain about the busy bank. I fired up my workstation and started checking the connections. Sure enough, I found three users playing MUDs almost immediately. I remotely hung up their connections on two because they were just sitting there doing nothing. Likely they were in mid-game and got up to do something else, like use the restroom, but the third was actively moving about in the game. I watched him for a bit and realized that he was moving through a section of the MUD that was long and boring but he had memorized its path, so he had just typed NNNNNNN due to the modem's speed so it would just scroll while his character moved. In other words, he was just caching his moves to combat the speed of the modem. I couldn't just let that one go without some fun. I noticed that he had found a dragon and was killing it over and over again and in between killings, running back to whatever location to drop off all the goodies. I waited until he was in the middle of whatever forest maze region he was trying to get through and I inserted a few commands to his list via the Control Center app. It ended up reading like this. My inserts are in bold. North, 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 east, east, north, north, east, unequip all, north, east, drop all, north, north, east, east, north, kill dragon. He never saw it coming, and he never saw the end, because when he finally realized his character was not only not pummeling the dragon, but getting its butt handed to him, he tried to run. Except that I wouldn't let him. South, north, south, north, south, north, South, North. Eventually, I got tired of it and I kicked him off the modem bank but took over his connection to the mud and let the dragon eat him. Then I made an announcement to the general mud as him that I was giving up all my stuff and the first person to find it on the way to the dragon's lair could have it all. The guy did eventually log back onto the modems later in the evening because, you know, they were busy and found himself with absolutely no gear and no money. While he was messaging his in-game friends about how the game was screwing him over, I typed a message to his terminal directly. If you continue to use the university's modem bank to play games, this will continue to happen. He dropped his connection immediately. Pretty sure I ruined that guy's evening. But hey, the boss said no gaming via the modems. I heard word got around really quickly after that. Someone was spying on all the modems. And lo and behold, the 24-hour terminal labs at late night gamers again. You weren't supposed to be doing it, got his butt handed to him and more for doing so. I don't know too much about these games, so I don't know how long it took him to amass all that gear and money and stuff, but I can tell that it was pretty demoralizing to have all that stuff taken from you. And for him to find out the truth like that and realize that somebody is actually monitoring that and influencing the inputs into his game, it's kind of funny to hear about. Transfer policy keeps being broken. Thanks for the invite to take two hour breaks. Short, but satisfying. I work for a major call center provider and we have a lot of policy on transferring calls. When we can just throw you to the wind and when we have to stay with you through the transfer. Following the rules makes performance metrics almost impossible to meet, so people rarely do. In light of the outbreak and some coaching about how I usually would transfer, I've enjoyed spending two to five hours a day on hold to our travel partners. 
paid time where I just listen to bad music and apply for other jobs on my phone. Only fallout right now is I get to know the people around me more since we're all kind of on the same page. Well, honestly, it sounds like it's not a bad gig if you don't mind kind of sitting around trying to find ways to occupy yourself for the two to five hours a day. Because otherwise, then it's just kind of free money. You're not really doing anything. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for listening to and watching the Storytime channel. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing and let us know what you thought about these stories in the comments below. Thank you all again for watching and listening to the Storytime channel.